Good afternoon. Welcome to my session about simplicity and why it enables an evolutionary architecture. So we had some technical problems here, but now we are ready to go. Uh, so nowadays, when you write software, almost all technical problems solved. When you write software nowadays, I would just suggest you do it something like this. So you have a team, typically the developers, that build a product and they should release it to some users and customers. And yeah, nowadays with all this agile stuff and all this thing, uh, you should deliver continuously. So you build something small, you deliver it so that the users and customers can give you feedback on it. Whether you have built the right thing, at least you're on the right path or no, that's not the way to go. So you can adapt early and frequently. And for us architects, that's a challenge because uh, 15 years ago, we sat down with the customer. What do you want? I want all this fancy stuff. Okay, I draw some diagrams for a couple of months and then we started the project and then in the end we failed. But nowadays, uh, we want to build in small steps, small increments. And when we do this, yeah, how do we design an architecture in the beginning? I don't know where the journey will lead to. And today I have some tips for you. What we do in our team uh, with the customers I consult to get an architecture that can evolve over several years. So I have three enablers. The first enabler is simplicity. That's why the talk is called simplicity. And simplicity means things are simple if they are easy to understand. You can look at some code, at the design, at an architecture, and you understand it. Because only when you understand it, you're able to change it. You probably know that. You have some code, you have to make a change, but you don't really understand the code. So there's a lot of fear that yeah, I can change that, but I'm not sure that the right thing will happen or whether there will be a lot of bugs afterwards. So only if we understand things, we are able to change them. Uh, more about simplicity later. The second enabler I will talk about is splitting and deferring decisions, design decisions, architectural decisions. So we don't design everything at the beginning, so we but we make a lot of steps, even in the design. And this enables us to build a solution in a lot of steps and to be able to deploy them, to show them, and to get feedback on, on what we did up to now. And the third enabler is architectural refactoring. So when the feedback comes in, we should be able to react on the feedback doesn't help much if you get a lot of feedback and say, yeah, but we can't change that anymore. So you have to build an architecture that can be changed, that can be refactored. So, and for me, simplicity is also the basis to enable the other both enablers. So let's start with simplicity. I have a small model here and the model is not perfect. Actually, it's quite flawed, but I like it because it helps me to talk about simplicity to you. But don't hang me with the simplicity of this diagram, please. Uh, we have two axes. On the vertical axis, um, when we look at the solution to a problem, a solution can be very concrete. So, um, or it can be abstract, far away from reality. For example, uh, you are all sitting in a seat. The seat is somewhere in the middle. When I talk about the red seat that uh, stands in uh, my kitchen and belongs to my daughter, that's really concrete because there is only one such seat. Otherwise, if I want to go more abstract, I could talk about furniture. You are all sitting in some piece of furniture. That's true, but not really helpful if I want to explain something, is it? Or I could say, yeah, let's go all the way. You are sitting, I see a lot of entities sitting in entities here. That's true, probably not helpful. And I see a lot of code that is written this style. 
And on the horizontal axis, I have specific solutions. That's a solution for exactly one single problem. And on the left, I have generic solutions. That's a solution I, comply, I can apply to a lot of different problems. For example, the Java-based libraries, .NET-based libraries, they are very generic. They allow us to build all the software that we build. They have to be generic. But there are some drawbacks with generosity. And now, if I look at all this space, where do I want my solution to be so that it's easy? It's probably on the bottom right. Things that are concrete and specific are much simpler to understand than things that are generic and abstract. So that's the comfortable zone there. On the other side, top left, this is, this is the hard part. Things that are too abstract, too generic, are hard to understand. So when we build software, I should stay in the light, I was told. Um, we should start at the bottom right for simple solutions. So we start with the first feature. We build a solution only for the first feature, for the first user. Simple, concrete, specific. And I know there are a lot of teams out there that really like to start at the bottom left. What do they do? The first thing they do, so that they are really fast afterwards, do you know it? They build a framework. The framework is generic, it's abstract, and it probably doesn't solve the concrete problem when it's done. So start at the bottom right, a simple solution. And it's small, it's, everybody can understand it, and then you add feature and feature and feature, and you probably start to walking up to the top left a bit. But all is fine, we're still in the green, and you continue, it's still fine, everything is understandable, and then maybe one day you say, yeah, it gets a little bit difficult. It's not legacy-style monolithic code yet, but it gets bigger to understand. And my tip is that when you think about the solutions you implemented after you implemented them, again, you look for easier designs, you refactor your code as much as you can, then in my experience what happens after several weeks, several months, one day you wake up and say, ah, now we could, that, we could, make, we could do that much simpler. And then you can refactor that to make it simpler, to get back to the bottom right. Doesn't only happen when you invest a lot into refactoring and thinking about your solutions after you designed them, after you implemented them. And so you can keep your solution in a maintainable, understandable state. So now I have some tips to keep it at the bottom right. The first tip is when you design your software, you should, should design it in a way that the design of your software reflects the mental model of your users. So every user of your system, in their head, they have some model how your system behaves. Maybe it's true, maybe it's wrong, but every user has a model. Because every, when I press this button, then probably this and this will happen. And your software should be the same. They should match. Then it's easy to follow when a user says, yes, that's great, but it should be different and there is no mapping in between. So when your users talk about emails, letter documents, as an example, then the clever developers, I know a lot of clever developers say, yeah, but that's the same. They all hold text. So let's design a text content holder with text content. Much faster, only one class, not free. We are really, really fast now. And everything works out nicely for a couple of weeks, and then suddenly one user comes with the feedback, yeah, but documents should have pages. I want to have a page number. And then you say, yeah, okay, that's, that's good feedback. We should implement that, so we add, should you add a page number to text content holder? So, but emails don't have page numbers. And then, that's where complexity comes in. Suddenly you have 
models that don't reflect the, the reality. You have suddenly emails with page numbers, which make no sense. So you shouldn't model it this way. You should model emails, letters, and documents separately when your users talk with these three words. Yeah, that should the same model from your users' heads and in your design. It just makes change much, much easier. Second tip is we should model behavior, not entities. What do I mean by that? We have a book here, and if I model with entities in mind, it could possibly look like this. I say, yeah, what are the properties of a book? A book has a, a title, an author, an ISBN, uh, readers will add ratings, and of course, we want to sell books, so a book has to have a price. And we model this, and we save it in the database, and are more or less happy. If you model with behavior in mind, it looks quite differently. I think, about what can I do with a book? Not what the properties, but what can I do with a book? And I can create the book in my catalog, then I probably should know the title, the author, the ISBN, and of course, I'm human, so I will make typos. So I have the behavior to correct an incorrect title, for example. Then readers want to add ratings, so I should be able to add ratings. And I should be able to set the price. And the price will probably change over time. Maybe I can add a book to the catalog without the price, because I don't know the price yet. So we will add it later. And the big difference for me is with these two ways of designing software is that in the software I have seen, so that's not a global truth, but in the software I have seen, thinking entities leads to tightly coupled, very big models. These are the models when, yeah, I want, get, I want to get one data record and I have to read the whole database because everything is in there, in this book class. Whereas when you model with behaviors, you tend to get multiple models. You get a model for updating only the, the title, author, and ISBN, and you tend to get a model about pricing or a model about rating. So you get typically multiple models, decoupled models that are much simpler, they are much smaller, and you can change one model without affecting the others. And important is the, the plural S at the end. So you deal with multiple models. And the idea is that in sum, multiple simple small models are simpler overall than one big model. So that tends to be true for bigger systems. Third tip is about modularization. So we should modularize, say, modularize. It's a difficult word for me, I don't know why. But you should modularize your system. Um, but keep in mind, if you split something apart, you don't have one problem, you have three. Because you had one part, one problem, now we split it up into two things. You have the smaller problems and you have the integration problem. Never forget about that. Hopefully, the three problems are simpler than the one big problem. And if, when you are working in a module, in the code, in the model above, um, the only thing you have to know is the stuff in this model. But that should be highly cohesive, that should belong together, you can't take something out, it wouldn't work. And you have to know the interfaces, the contracts of the modules you are working with, the models you are interacting with, the modules at the bottom. And if you split up your software, I think our software has around, I don't know, 200, 300 modules. A, a single model is really small. It's four or 500 lines of code. And this is a size I can keep in my head. I can understand. I can look at the whole module and I can make a change uh, without the fear of breaking the software. Of course, we have tests as well, but I first have to make the change in my head, the design change. And that's only possible if I have really high degree of modularization. Um, that's one problem 
when you talk about architecture and they don't make a local change but a big change and multiple modules are affected, yeah, then I have to change these modules. So the model bounds doesn't help me there. But luckily, that's not every day that this happens. Next tip is, um, we want an architecture that we can change, so of course we should build it as flexible and configurable as possible, yes? No, really not. It's the worst thing you can do to your software, build it flexible and configurable. Because with every configuration you add, you double the test cases. You can have a toggle on or off, you double the test cases. You build flexibility in, you think we will need that, probably a different change will come and you have accidental complexity in your system. So my tip for most contexts, it's not a global uh, and universal truth again, but for most contexts for typical business applications that we probably all write, hard code it as much as you can. If you have to change it, then change the code and deploy it again. Most teams I've seen they have a lot of configuration files, but when they change the configurations, all the systems shut down and come up again. So it's the same way as if I deploy the system. That's not true for all systems, that's clear, but for most systems, it's much easier to just hard code the stuff. And if it changes, build it, release it again. And my last tip is, when you add something new, think about how you get rid of it when you want to delete it. Things we add should be easy to remove. Because then I can remove it, replace it with something different. And one way to do this is, I call it the, the rucksack principle. Um, you just, like a rucksack, you add it to a person. You don't change the person, you just add the rucksack. And you can take the rucksack off again without hurting the person. I hope so. And the same should be with our systems. I, I add a new functionality, and the analogy is not that great, because at least one piece in the software has to, new, to know the, the new functionality. That's the composition route, the code that builds the system. That one has to know the new functionality so that it can add it to the system. But when you can do that, only composition route, know something new, that's great, because then it's really, really easy to remove it. Just remove it from the composition route and it's gone. Of course, that's not always possible. So if you can do that, at least minimize the number of incoming dependencies. The fewer dependencies you have on the incoming side, it's easier to remove it, if you have to remove it. And the third tip is, don't build systems or designs, object hierarchies that have long chains. So, a class that knows a class, that knows a class, that knows a class, that knows a class, that knows a class. That's much harder to change than something like in the picture on the right, where you have a very broad tree, but a shallow tree. That's much easier to change because the chains the dependency change are much shorter. One consequence of this design is that you have a lot of orchestrators. So the topmost square is probably an orchestrator. Its only job is to, oh, I have to do something, yeah. Okay, you do this, you do this, you do this, I combine the result and return it. You get a lot of this kind of code, classes or functions or whatever. But it's much easier to change these orchestrators. You can add a new case between the first and the second call. Yeah, just call a new subtree. Remove a subtree. When you have long change and you have to remove something in the middle, yeah, what happens with the rest of the chain? It's much more difficult. So, so much about simplicity. Let's talk about splitting and deferring decisions. So, you have a big design or architecture problem that you want to solve. And the first thing I recommend is think about the problem. Don't think about the solution. Think about the problem, try to understand it, and try to split the problem into sub-problems. Sub-problems that you can solve more or less independently. They are a little bit connected because they belong to the same big problem, but most of the times you can 
split the problem into sub-problems. And then we start not with the first sub-problem, it's important, we start with an overall concept, with an idea how we get to a solution that solves all the problems. Because if we just look at the first problem, the likelihood that we end up in a dead end is very high. So we have to have an overall concept. Yeah, maybe this direction, we don't know yet for sure, but yeah, we have some options that should work out somehow. Then we start with the first problem, we find the solution, we implement it, we show it to our users, we get feedback, we validate if the sub-problem is really solved, and if the feedback, we adapt our overall concept. We probably learn a lot with the first sub-problem. We continue with the second, and then maybe we find out, yeah, the third sub-problem, that's actually not a problem at all, nobody uses this. But maybe I have found problem, sub-problem four and five that we forgot in the beginning because we didn't knew enough about the problem at all. So now we have a better understanding, we find a better solution, uh, we have a, a better problem, so to speak, that we can solve. And at the end, when you think you're finished, show it to the users, get feedback if you're really finished. And with this approach, you can get early feedback and you can adapt to the feedback before you have spent all the money or sp spent a lot of time. So this is very abstract. And said abstract is difficult to understand, so let's make, let, let's make it uh, more concrete with a problem of persistency. Persistency because every system has to persist data. Oh, do you agree? Almost every system has to persist data. That's true, but probably when you start with a new product, the first couple of weeks nobody cares about persistence. The thing you have to show in the first couple of weeks is we can solve the business problem. And most of the times persistence is not part of the business problem. It just has to be there later, but not in the beginning. So when we started our product, it's a time tracking, software, uh, we just had all data in memory for six months. After six months, we knew we can build a better system than the old system. It's much easier to work with the system, it's easier for the users, and we had a lot of feedback, but nobody cared about persistent data. Just run a demonstration, put some pre-calculated data in memory, and you can make a demonstration. So later, um, after a couple of months, we said, yeah, that's nice, but a little bit abstraction between business logic and data access would be nice, because sooner or later we have to persist, so introduce some interfaces, some functions to abstract business logic and data access. And after, yeah, maybe six, seven months, we said, yeah, now it would be nice if we had really a storage for the data so that we can run longer demos and if the system goes down, the data is still there. But the great thing was that at this point, after six months, we had a lot of knowledge about the data that we have, uh, how much data there will probably be, uh, the kind of the data, is it more uh, relational data, is it, or would be a document database a better choice, or even some key value or graph-based databases. The choice was really easy after six months. We knew what data we had. And then that's where the overall concept comes into play. We always knew that we had a target size of 25,000 users, and we anticipated with 25,000 users, users, we probably need some kind of scaling. So we, when we started at the top, we always had in our mind, someday we probably need some scaling. So we only choose options that didn't prevent to scale later. We didn't scale for a long time because a single database, even in production, was good enough, a single instance running the code was good enough to a couple of hundred users, it's fast enough. Uh, but some, at some date we decided, yeah, it, it gets a little bit slow, we should choose a scaling option. 
But because we had always in mind that someday we probably need scaling, we still had these options. We didn't get into a deadlock or in a dead end. Yeah, on scaling, you can choose between horizontal, vertical, or the no scaling, but do it when you need to do it, not as the first thought. As I hear in many conference talks about scaling, scaling, scaling. You can run a lot of requests on a single server, on a single instance. So, and the same thing we did not only for persistent, but for all these architectural aspects. So it's a lot of code, it's a really big screen, so it may <laughs> be possible to read it. I don't go through these topics. If you want them, send me an email or Google this talk in the internet. It's there somewhere. I just want to pick one, it's in the middle. It's uh, this one here. Archiving data, because it's for me it's a classic. It's the one thing that most teams forget. People they write software and it's great, uh, it's a success, there are a lot of users using the system and someday the system gets slow because there is just too much data in the database, the queries get slow. Then, yeah, okay, we have a lot of data that we don't actually need anymore, so we just archive it away. And then you realize, yes, but we have a rational data model and we have foreign keys and I can't delete data in my database then you have a really, really big design problem. So, thinking five minutes, at the after a couple of months in, the pro in, a, in, your, in your working on the product, may save you months of work later. You don't have to implement anything for archiving, but define a concept how you want to introduce archiving later, so you can do it. So, third enabler, architectural refactoring, and they added the word continuous. So, if you have to change your architecture, you have some decision tree here. First question is, do you stay on the same runtime environment? So, if you are on Java, do you stay on Java? Or, as in our case, we had Fox Pro in the alt system, and you switch to .NET. So, if you stay in the same runtime, that's the easy way. Then you can think about the change I want to make. Can I isolate this change from the rest of the system? If you can, then isolate it, uh, write some abstractions around it so that you can tear out this isolated part, change it, re-engineer it, refactor it, whatever, and integrate it again. So, and Typically, this isolation is a bit hard work, but it's, it depends on how nice your system was designed and modularized. Uh, it's typically good, uh, doable in a good way in a short time. At the end, I put integrate optionally because sometimes you want to keep it isolated because it's, because it's a good module boundary. Sometimes you change something and want to uh, to break the hard isolation because you want to change the, the, the design, how things are modularized. Depends on the context. If you have a fundamental architecture change, so you can't isolate it, it goes across the whole system, then I'd advise you to use some rolling refactoring. So over the time of the refactoring, you have two architectures in your system at the same time. The old way, the new way. That means you probably have to introduce some code to deal with these two concepts. So maybe you have to write data to two places, two databases, the old, the new one. Maybe you have to aggregate data from new database and old database. Maybe you have algorithms that run in parallel, the old and the new one. But the big benefit of this is that you have a system that runs all the time, even during the refactoring. So you can do refactorings that take 12 months. You can always add features, you can change code, you can ev do everything else. You have a system that runs. Maybe it runs a little bit slower because it always has to do two things. Maybe the complexity is higher during the refactoring, that's clear, but the goal is that once I 
moved all the old code to the new way, I can remove all the old stuff and it should be simpler than before. If you switch runtime environments, um, that's a difficult part and this is just some recipe here um, because the approach should be highly context dependent on your situation, on the technology, where you want to go. But as a general rule, I would say the first thing you have to do in the old system, you have to meet some preconditions. And the precondition is you take a big, big knife and slice your system into, I called it, business capabilities on the slide. Things that are mostly independent from each other. For the DDD folks, a bounded context or a module or, if you want so, a microservice in the end. Think in this direction. And one thing I have to introduce is communication between the slices, because I want to move them one after the other to the new runtime, I have to introduce inter-process communication. Maybe in an old system it's probably just method calls. I have to replace this with inter-process communication that can be over service bus, over HTTP, named pipes, maybe when they're on the same server. All possible. And the most difficult part is typically with the user interface. Because, um, yeah, the user interface has to call the old and the new stuff. So you have some options there. You make the old UI so that it can call the new stuff, if possible. You can uh, have two user interfaces, the old one calling the old stuff, and a new one that calls the new stuff. Maybe your users are capable of dealing with two user interfaces. That's the simplest technical solution, but it's for the user, it's sometimes really hard. If both are web, you may can uh, combine them with, uh, just with links. Or you build the, the new interface first, calling the old stuff, but that's really hard to get it right. Because you are always constrained by the old implementation. And then you switch business capability by business capability, like the rolling refactoring, until everything is new. And then you probably still have a lot of refactoring to do to clean all this mess up, all the things you had to compromise because of the old system. So that's not what we did. We just built a new product if a new market segment and kept the old one as it was. Because that's really, really hard and yeah. You probably know this. So, and you heard a lot of things today, multiple times. The word I said probably most was feedback, and the second one was refactoring. And what I hear from many teams is, that sounds nice, that sounds reasonable, but we don't have time to do that. We just have to deliver features. Management wants features, 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 features. And here I have a tool for you if you're in this situation. And I applied these tools with quite some managers and it worked quite well. <laughs> it's no uh, uh, silver bullet, but it's, it helps. Again, you have, I have some quadrants. On the vertical axis, I have at the bottom are things that we do that are technically related more to the team, um, about design, about code. At the top, I have business things, business like things that in are interesting for our users, customers, managers. On the right, I have things for the future. And on the left, I have things that come back to us from the past. So top right, business, future, this is where we have features. We build a feature today so that we can deploy it tomorrow so that the day after tomorrow, more users are using our system. Top left, we have defects. Software doesn't behave as it should, so they come back to us from the past. We have to fix them or support. So users don't understand the system, they call support and they need help. Uh, bottom left, I put technical debt. Uh, things that we wished would be different from where we are at the moment. And th these are typical things that slow us down. And uh, bottom right are is architectural innovation. Uh, we want to invest in the architecture, in the design, so that we are able 
to build future features. Maybe there's a feature we can't build with the current architecture, so we have to change the architecture so that we are, so that we are able to introduce this new feature. And one thing you can do is sit with your team, think about the last 12 months, and put percentage numbers in every quadrant. How much capacity did you invest in which quadrant? Um, the sum of the numbers should be 100, and every number should be greater or equal to zero. Just for the manager mathematics are sometimes weird, just to make that clear. So, and what I get a lot is, yeah, 50% features, 45% box and support, 5% technical debt. 0% architectural innovation. So that's uh, the, the baseline I typically get. And these are really bad numbers. The problem is not with 50% features, that's okay. The problem is that the 45% or the 40% box is the problem. A good box support number is probably 5%. So my tip if you are in this death spiral of just having to uh, deliver feature is and you have a lot of defects, you should invest to reduce the defects. And the thing that works best, in my opinion, is you introduce a zero bug policy. That means if you find a bug, you fix it now or never. You don't have a list of, no, uh, of bugs, you just don't have it. You fix it or you forget about it. It will come back if it's important. <laughs> Doesn't mean to write crap code. So most bugs you should fix immediately, but some bugs are just not worth the time. So don't manage them, it just takes time, forget about them. And if you fix all the bugs when they occur, so don't throw away everything you have in your hands, just complete your task, and if there is a bug, fix the bug as your next task. Multitasking is uh, evil. So. The consequence is that your bug number will dramatically go down. And when your bugs go down, you have more capacity. So when this goes down, oh, I skipped something, I will tell about this later. When you get capacity that you can move from um, fixing bugs to technical debt. The same is with support, I forgot about this, is when you have a system that is hard to to uh, use, make it easier to use. Think about what quality attributes of your system are very important. Is it learnability? Is it, should it be easier to use? Um, is it just weird? Uh, whatever is important from the quality side for the user and improve that as well. So then you have more capacity to pay down technical debt. And when you have less technical debt, you don't invest the capacity into feature. No, no, you keep features at 50%, but you have less technical debt, which slows you down less, which makes you faster. So with the same capacity on features, you can deliver more features. And the managers, whoa, and are happy, a little bit happier maybe. So you pay down technical debt until you have enough capacity that you can invest in your design in, in your architecture. So, and when you do that, you finally can implement the feature your managers always ask for. So that's just one way through this uh, diagram here, but uh, I hope it's helpful to you. Uh, if you need su uh, support of this, yeah, write me an email. So I'm no consultant, I don't have to sell myself, so, but you can write me an email, I try to help you. So to sum up, um, for me, simplicity is the basis that enables everything we do to get a system that we can change. Because on the one side, we get extensibility, we can decide in steps, choose the right option at the right time, which allows to get early feedback. On the other side, simplicity uh, allows me to have a system that I can change, that I actually can refactor, and refactoring allows 
adaptability. If you get feedback, we have to change something. We really can act on this feedback. So it's the basis for building a system in steps. And to put the buzzword here, it's what we need for agile software development or modern software development. So that's the conclusion of my talk. So we have two minutes for questions. Or afterwards, after the session, I'm still here, so we can also ask afterwards. The problem is I can't see you. There seems to be a question. Just shout it, I can repeat it. Yeah, the question was how do we organize uh, getting feedback? Um, there are some metrics that are, uh, how did you call it? Um, that are not biased, it's just they show how things are used. If you have a questionnaire, you probably get a lot of negative feedback, which is not matching reali reality. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, when we built our, built our system, we, we looked for better users. So we talked with persons. We didn't do questionnaires. Of course, we had a lot of metrics. We see how the system is used. That's valuable feedback, of course. But we talk with people. And we show them our system. We, sh we ask them, what they, do they think about the system? So time tracking is not something new. Everybody knows it. So. A lot of people had a lot of opinions how it should be, so we get a lot of feedback from better users. And with, when you really release the feature for the broad users, um, from time to time, our customer, uh, the people that are close to the customers, I don't know the word in English, um, they, talk, they try to talk with the people. Are you happy with the system? Do you miss something? What do you like? It's the only way we get feedback, and we get a lot of feedback. It's already almost too much feedback um, to really uh, react to it. So we don't like questioners or something like this. Does this help you? Not a question? Um, first, we are a really small company, that makes things easier. <laughs> and uh, my manager just, te just tells us, you are the developers, you have to know what you have to do, that the system is running. And when we say you have to refactor, he says, okay, you have to refactor. And I think it's the only way that it works. Because, yeah, you don't tell your... Uh, uh, your doctor, how he has to apply medicine to you. Normal people don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the best to say after two years of a pandemic, but... Yeah, I don't see another way. If they don't think you are capable of doing your job, yeah, what do you want to do? 
So the refactoring is an integral part of doing software development. If you do something like test-driven development, you are refactoring every other minute. So it just belongs to our job. Yeah. Okay, if there are just a little bit over time now, so thank you very much for being here. I hope you can take something with you. And yeah, I'm not I'm so used to doing remote talks, and normally at the end you can say, write in the chat how you like to talk on a scale from 1 to 10. I can't do that here, so it's really pain. Uh, because it's on the app, yeah, but I don't see the results there. <laughs> so, but yeah, have a good time today. <laughs>